we're, we're speaking to you, everyone watching um, from history, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I've never done this before. Uh, directly from history, uh, we are speaking to you, analyzing today's events, but from the past, uh, because this is a pre-recorded show. So as a historian, um, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to, to be history. Um, having said all that nonsense, uh, we have got a lot to talk about. We also have a relative, we have a somewhat shorter show. Um, we have to be out of here in an hour. So we should get to it quickly, but let's, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm taking your job right now, but I was just, yeah, yeah, say, yeah. well, why don't you do it? What are we going to oh, talk about? I forgot about? to say also in the, in the pre-show work we did, uh, Look You're also going to be teaching a new course for Unregistered Academy. Oh, yeah, my God. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Renegade history straight from the source. So, yeah. Um, still, many or most, I don't know, maybe half the people who know about me um, know about me because of my book, A Renegade History of the United States, which was published 15 years ago. And I have never until now given any sort of live presentation with discussion about it um meaning i've never taught it as a course in any way um and a lot of people have asked for this and i sort of resisted for various reasons but no i've always wanted to do it and i finally decided to do it so at unregistered academy starting april 10th, 10th. um we're doing a four-part interactive webinar which will also be available for streaming video later but if you want to come and it's a zoom meeting zoom class part of the Academy, um, four parts. We're going to do the whole book from start to finish. And also there'll be some new renegades that I have discovered from history since I wrote the book, which is not hmm. surprising, as well as many renegades of today. That's the number one question I've always gotten about the book is who are the renegades today? And I originally I had a hard time thinking for finding any, but by now, after hmm. 15 years later, after there's plenty of plenty of people and movements and causes, I suppose, or behaviors and activities more like it around the world. Also, not just in the United States that are absolutely renegade that are creating new freedoms or pioneering new, new spaces of freedom that the rest of us are then occupying. And you know who the greatest renegade is, of course, it's the internet. Um, it's not a person. It's not even necessarily a group of people, but it's this thing, the internet that's uh i think maybe the most renegade force in certainly american history but probably world history but yeah so that's going to be a part of it what are, all the the renegade anarchic in good ways forces that have been created and unleashed by and through the internet uh, will be a major focus at the end of the course but the first you know the much of it will be most of it will be you know we will go from before the founding colonial era and we'll talk about all the drunks and prostitutes and the slaves um, and the fornicators of various sorts who did things that were absolutely illegal, immoral, illicit in various ways that we all now do on a daily basis, actually. Um, but we don't know that the people who first pioneered those, those freedoms were the lowest of the low, the, the riffraff, the scum of society. So if you don't, if you're not aware of the book or the argument in it, that's it. Um, and what is amazing is after surveying the entire history of all these various low life renegade types, um, creating new freedoms that we all now take for granted, it's remarkable how much of American culture that is not formal culture. I'm not talking about what the government says or what the schools say but i'm talking about the way americans just live and think day to day mm -hmm. the culture of america i'd say is overwhelmingly produced by those who were once considered to be the worst americans the worst people and that's what's most exciting about it. when i started doing the research for that book it um i started seeing the world through a new lens and when i first started teaching it before i wrote the book teaching what I was finding, um, teaching at Columbia and Barnard. I mean, that's what students would say to me. They'd say, wow, now I have a whole new lens through which to look at the world. And it doesn't necessarily stop you from seeing the world through different lenses. Um, but, but this one, I promise you, 
you will certainly look at American society, the world you live in, your own mind, actually, the way you think culturally, the things that make you American, you will absolutely see them very differently. And it upturns all the narratives, the conservative narrative, the liberal narrative for sure. There is no other story of American history like this one. I can mm -hmm. guarantee that. Um, whether That's kind of class time, but uh, these new renegades, are you going to address the Michael Malice theory that uh, your incel right-wing trolls are the renegades of today? <laughs> yeah, Malice loves to mention my book, that book. He's a huge fan of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I... Um, so there are rene so there are renegades who do things that we now value, or I should say that I value, right? So, um, like you know, for instance, you know, who's responsible for ending prohibition? It was the mafia, and the Jewish mafia, gangsters, right? Um, because you know, I'm glad that we have legal alcohol. I'm glad that you can drink without going to prison now. It's a good thing. Then we have like renegade anarchic behavior that's not so fun, not so cool, that doesn't create things of value, right? Like a lot of crime. Some crime, like violating prohibition, was tremendous, wonderful, because again, for me and most people, it matched our values. But that doesn't mean that I just celebrate anything that is against the norms. I think norms against murder are fantastic, and I'd like to keep them. Um, I think norms... <laughs> I think norms against nihilistic, sadistic, vicious, anonymous attacks on people's personhoods because of their politics also were great. I think we should have norms against that. So, I mean, internet trolls, for me, that's mostly who they are. Um, and they don't do so the, yes they're very anarchic they're very renegade sure they're violating all the norms absolutely the alt-right in general but some of those norms i like to have um around and i and i don't think they've actually contributed much that i find of value um i'm speaking you know of like comment sections that's who i'm that's what i'm thinking of or like reply guys on twitter um i i don't know how much we've gained from them that i value or that we would value. I don't know. I guess they increase the amount of freedom there is. Mm -hmm. That's true, but it's freedom or license to throw rocks at people in the public square. You know, oh, here's all the people down there who talk about society and make, and some of them make decisions about society. I get throwing rocks at them, but now it's okay to throw rocks at some journalist on you know, some TV show, TV station. I mean, it's anyway, uh, no, I do. I disagree. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, but I think something like the dark web. Yeah. And all like, uh, Ross Ulbricht, who's, I, he just, I think he turned 40 just week. I think he's been in prison for how long now? Like a decade. But yeah. Like that kind of thing. Um, it's a place, you know, where people could buy any drug of any kind at any time and a full open free market for those drugs right there at your fingertips. Um, that is what I'm talking about. Um, because by the way, people who are like, oh my God, heroin overdoses. No, we have lots of evidence to show that the availability of drugs and the legality of them has nothing to do with overdose rates, addiction rates, et cetera. <clears throat> a lot of what they sell on the dark web are painkillers for people with chronic pain, like real chronic pain. And this is, you know, these are drugs and make it life livable for many, many people. I could go on, but anyway, that's what I'm talking about. So, um, so I no, think, it, it's yeah. freedoms that I'm interested in mm -hmm. to do things that we actually value. Uh, I think anonymous trolls, sort of like the Groypers, to put a face to the name, a more specific name, I guess. Uh, the movement of young men uh online under anonymity mm. uh bringing up on the right issues about israel in a <laughs> smirking anti-semitic way i think mm. they laid the groundwork for there being a real dissident movement on the right i don't think you get tucker carlson and candace owens without nicholas fuentes 
uh, blazing that trail uh, five years ago and uh, critiquing Ben Shapiro and critiquing uh, Con Inc. So I, most people don't know that the reason I know you and the reason you're here mm -hmm. is that you took a, a course of mine a few yeah. years ago <laughs> on American history is sort of a renegade history. It was a, it was a piece of renegade history. Um, yeah. I say, who the fuck is this kid? Um, I have to hire him. <laughs> yeah. So um, the radical edge, the radical vanguard, and in, the, in this case, it would be the radical intellectual vanguard. And I do believe that the alt-right is made up of radicals. Don't get me wrong. I think they're the real deal radicals. They are absolutely, as I said, violating many or most of the norms of the liberal establishment. Um, and in doing so, yeah, they've paved the way for breaking down a lot of the norms that I did want destroyed by the in, in the liberal most of the liberal establishment i want burned to the ground don't get me wrong and it's not even i don't i wouldn't even say the the norms that i value are even liberal necessarily but in fact mm -hmm. they're not they're more hedonistic um more about individual liberty and freedom but um so fuentes and company you could eat bronze age pervert probably the most important one because apparently his book was getting passed around the white house when trump was there you know mm -hmm. i mean so very really so really being the vanguard the leading edge of this new radical intellectual movement which is what the alt-right is and i'm using alt-right because i think it sort of encompasses the whole last 10 years which is what when it started 2014 i think is when bap said they basically started on twitter um that movement um would Trump, the MAGA movement, all the anti-liberal, illiberal, in a good way, I think, movements of the right of the last 10 years, would they have emerged without those little anti-Semitic racist fucks who hate women in their mom's basements saying, <clears throat> saying nasty things about, and by the way, yes, I have an edge on, on this because <laughs> I was a victim of one of the kings of the alt-right. Um, if anybody wants to, uh, I don't know. Get a look at this. Um, what's his face? Can't bot. Oh yeah. He lured, he, I didn't, cause I, this was a long time ago before I knew about any of this stuff. He tricked me and got me on his show and pretended just, I didn't know idea what he was. And so he, it's ridiculous, but it was just basically making fun of the, the, the academic guy is what they were trying mm -hmm. to do. But anyway, um, the misogyny, pisses me off maybe more than anything but um could that have happened all the good aspects the whole challenge to the covid regime the whole challenge to the lockdowns and the masking all that came from the dissident alt-right great stuff much as you said much of the opposition to american wars abroad much of it comes from the dissident alt-right Michael Weimer, are you suggesting that we could not have had those critiques of the liberal regime without racism and misogyny and just, and you know what, you know what really bothers me about them? It's just the meanness. It's the meanness of the 15 year old boys I was in high school with who would call you fag, you know, that kind of thing. It's, the, it's, 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 there's a lot of delayed adolescence going on too, which I just find extremely unattractive and unappealing in men women too but yeah it's so i put it to you is that what you're suggesting we could have we couldn't have had the what i think are the good stuff from the alt-right without the bad i think uh the yeah absolutely i think the meanness oh. and, and the adolescence of it uh is uh society that has radically transformed in the last let's say 50 years since the sexual revolution uh to where education for example, I think is uh, tailored for the uh, learning capabilities of young girls who are told to sit down and shut up and who do that a lot better than young boys who are rambunctious and want to be active. And uh, I think the, I, the identity of a white man, a straight white man has been demonized uh, in a lot of ways. And a lot of people uh, feel horribly resentful 
towards society at large uh, for uh, not having a place for them. Uh, and so these broader critiques of that society can only come from a place where uh, these repressed urges are allowed to be completely expressed. Uh, and yeah, uh, a lot of these more advanced critiques of liberal norms, which included Trump himself being memed into existence, I think uh, you don't get a Trump presidency without anonymous, uh, spiteful young men uh, making hilarious memes and celebrating the worst aspects of Trump's character and saying, no, that's not, that's not a bug. That's what we're trying to get across. That's a feature, not a bug. Uh, I don't think you get uh, the complete uh, revocation of uh, liberal norms around speech and around uh, the order of things, academia and foreign policy, without young men speaking like that. Oops. Well, okay, so the thing is <laughs> um, that there is there has been another way on the right to attack the liberal regime thoroughly and to attack the liberal regime um, intellectually, um, which I would call essentially the classical liberal, mm -hmm. libertarian, civil libertarian critiques of the liberal, you know, the reason magazines and the Mises is, I mean, I don't know those people. Um, I don't think you get bravery from those people though. I don't think you get the bravery, uh, to make some of the more outlandish and wildish wilder claims, unless you realize much like <laughs> here I am comparing them to slaves, but that you are beneath, uh, what is it beneath? Like you're just the bottom of society. Like nobody is hated more than an incel. You are, you are beneath contempt. And once you realize you're beneath contempt, there's a huge amount of freedom to just do whatever you want. Especially if you have the tool of the, the internet to be anonymous online and uh, throw tomatoes at people behind the coke of anonymity. So it's the anger, the energy, that revolutionary energy that Len someone like Lenin would call it. Um, sure. <clears throat> you, you, that's necessary for any serious change. Um, and that kind of anger, and that that is that is that energy is anger, which I think is right. The Bolsheviks, the, you know, all the revolutionaries have, have presented as angry. You know. Um, well, I guess that's why I, I don't like revolutionaries. Um, mm -hmm. There's a venge, vengefulness to it, which also I really don't like. Um, uh, like I've never wanted to put Hillary Clinton in prison and I bow to no one in my hatred of her. <laughs> you can't, I'm sorry. I, I, my, my, my hatred of Hillary Clinton is, is perfect. Um, you can't challenge it. But I've never wanted to hurt her or Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. My God, the woman is like a hair suit on the inside of my skin. She's so irritating to me, but I don't, I've never wanted to, I mean, oof, even just saying no, but I've never wanted to do any harm. I don't want any vengeance done mm -hmm. to my political opponents. Um, so I don't know. There's that, but I, I, hmm. the anger is a vengeful anger that's really what it is right it's it's not just we will have a better society when we eliminate what or sorry we will have a better society when we overturn it um it's we have those are the enemies we have enemies over there right so with the bolsheviks it was the capitalist class with the Maoists, it was the imperialist rotors with, you know, <clears throat> everybody with the fascists. It was the, the communists and the Jews were the enemy. And that's what people rallied around. And that's what happened. There's a lot of killing and suffering punishment of those people. So um, do I hate liberals? Oh, gosh. Again, the liberal regime. This is my whole career has been built on attacking the liberal regime. But I don't want to harm anybody. I mean, unless, you know, it's some some politician who actually ordered 
for me to be put in prison or something, um, then I'm down. <laughs> but, you know, short of that, no. And I think it's just a bad, it's a bad, it's a bad vibe shift <laughs> to, uh, to overturn things with a violent revolution. Uh, here's where the rubber meets the road on this. Uh, this week, VDare announced that it would shut down. Uh, VDare, the publication since 1999, that has uh, pretty much brought all these authors together. Gavin McInnes, the ones that you were interested in. Uh, Gavin McInnes, Jim Goad, who you've had on your show, wrote for them. Ann Coulter wrote on there. Patrick yep. Buchanan. Uh, mm -hmm. And then... Uh, more so a bunch of people anonymously wrote on there a lot of uh probably higher profile people i'm suspecting richard hanania wrote there under a pseudonym i'm suspecting yep. i don't know yep. um but yep. uh so they've been <laughs> so yeah. all, all the guests of unregistered basically have written for mm -hmm. v dare um yeah seems like yeah uh but they have been uh litigated by Letitia james the same attorney general going after trump uh who has been putting on these heavy subpoenas and heavy fines for not complying with the subpoenas, uh, trying to get them to release publicly who all these authors were, uh, getting them to turn over 40 gigabytes of emails to figure it out, all while not being charged with a crime. This is all just a broader investigation. And uh, a bash, and this is a big free speech story that uh, publications are being targeted without being charged for a crime. Wait, what is the... What does she say is the alleged crime that she's investigating? Uh, what hmm. is she charging them with? What's she accusing them of? I, didn't, I haven't heard that part. <laughs> what have they done besides be mean toward immigrants? Uh, yeah. And uh, racist. I mean, they are racist. They are, I think, avowedly racist. Hmm. I mean, they may, they're like race science guys. They take it seriously. Racism. I mean, they take their own racism seriously. <clears throat> no, but um, yeah. What is she charging them with? What did they do wrong? Did they violate a law? Uh, no. There's no actual charges. Wait, you're kidding? No, she's never said publicly what she's uh, investigating. Like hmm. what? That seems quite um authoritarian. Uh, it is authoritarian. <laughs> How strange that they would yeah. be authoritarian. <clears throat> hmm. That's amazing, though. That is, even for them, that's sort of remarkable that they wouldn't even. And what about, like, isn't the liberal media providing that, you know, writing hit pieces on VDARE and about how awful and racist and potentially, you know, had uh, date rape orgies, too? With the interns? When is the, when is the Me Tooing of VDARE going to happen? Because Calling them racist has not worked, apparently. But boy, <clears throat> if they find out that the racist head of VDARE had sex with an intern, it's all over. We'll have the FBI raiding them tomorrow. <clears throat> you still lurk looking for charges that there have been made? <laughs> yeah, I am. There are no... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Letitia. Yeah. Big sister, Letitia. That's what we mm -hmm. got to call her. I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but why? Why would she care at this point? That's so 2016. That's so 2017. Mm -hmm. it's uh, out of date. Probably to mm -hmm. uh, preemptively shut down speech and discourse and the ability for her, for mm. the Democratic opposition to communicate with each other during an election year. Mm. They're back at it. Yeah, they're bringing back Russiagate. I've been hearing Russiagate coming back lately in the discourse. Yeah, Putin controls this. Putin controls that. Putin ordered the uh, Crocus Hall terror attack. That's what they they end with that. Every time they make an analysis of that meaning, I'm talking about the liberal media. They'll be like, "Well, and there's also the possibility that." Putin himself ordered this. It's something the FSB has done before. Um, <clears throat> and which is not proven, by the way. Mm -hmm. The claim is that during the Chechnya war, when Putin was head of the FSB, he ordered the 
<clears throat> the infamous bombing of apartment buildings in Moscow. Or was it Southern Russia? So anyway, somewhere in Russia, there was a bombing, a horrific, hundred, I think hundreds of people were killed. Civilians just lying in, like asleep in their beds were killed. <clears throat> so and, and so they still hold, they still say that, well, that's Putin did that. And therefore he could have done this. Yeah, I think What's, it's sorry. The, the, the whole thing is about a castle that uh, Peter Brimelow had that he lived at since 2020. Back to V-Dare. So yeah. this is the V-Dare. This is the head of V-Dare, Peter Brimelow. Is a yeah. Right wing, again, racist, and I'm, I'm meaning that in a neutral way, but he just is. I mean, that's their thing. Um, their argument is that brown and black people are genetically inferior to whites and especially Nordics, and therefore we shouldn't allow them into the country. Um, I mean, that is their argument, right? <clears throat> Which, but they lay it out in exquisite detail, you know, and with a ton of data and research and powerful argumentation i've just never been persuaded <laughs> but but um i i certainly wish they would have um greater airing not less i want more I, people to talk about this stuff i think Letitia james's case that she's trying to make is that v is a non-profit and oh uh, 501c3 oh yeah however it uses its funds can be up to investigation and so this castle that peter brimelow lived in a long time might be a misallocation of funds and so, so <clears throat> can you get 501c3 status from the federal government if you are avowedly openly racist as an organization that's a great question is i don't even know what the is the law does the law say anything about that i don't think so. i mean well what about like openly you know revolutionary you know what if you were what if you had some nonprofit that whose mission was to overthrow the United States government? They're not going to give you 501c3 status for that. Um, and so I wonder if she's going to take that road in terms of arguing that an openly yeah. racist organization is tantamount to a treasonous organization because America stands against, I'm just imagining what her argument would be, has stood formally, at least since... 1964 against what these people espouse. I don't know. I'm, I'm at, what would the arg that would be the argument I would make? Mm -hmm. It's it's a terrible. I mean, it's, of course, I'm 100 percent on Vidar's side in this, but I think that would be an interesting argument too, because it's essentially what the argument she is make has to make. It has to be that in some formal way, racism is disallowed in American jurisprudence, right? That that we are, I think I know she's declaring that that's what this is. You're sort of declaring that it's illegal to be racist. Mm -hmm. Well, she's not gonna explicitly make that argument, I don't think. I think she's just gonna mm. subpoena as many investigations as possible and look for a misallocation of funds in the same way that you can't right. say Trump has bad opinions, so he shouldn't be president. You have to say, no, he, well, it's not so much what Letitia James herself will say; it's what yeah. the New York Times will say. Mm -hmm. It's what it's what MSNBC will say about why these people should be punished by the mm -hmm. law, because they are invite they, they're going to argue that they are in violation of the of American law because of Brown v. Board of Education, because of the Civil Rights Act, because mm -hmm. of the Voting Rights Act. Right? They're going to say, no, we as a country legally and formally are constituted as an anti-racist country. I think that's going to be the argument made by the hmm. liberal establishment. If they try to take away their nonprofit status, I don't think it'll go that far. I think it's the renegade argument to be made here is that it's akin to uh, Al Capone in that they couldn't get him for any other crime. So they went after him for taxes. Yeah. And I mean, so, sure. yeah, yeah, that too. I mean, look yeah. up for anything they can get on them, but no, but there's, yeah. there's going to have to be, you'll see. I mean, the liberal media will, will comment on this. Mm -hmm. And there has to be something greater than, oh, they found um, Peter Brimlow didn't take out his recycling, you know, at his castle. <clears throat> it has to be something ideological. They have to make it ideological because it is ideological, but they have to explain it ideologically. <clears throat> uh, all right. <laughs> there's, there's some other big news. I'm going to try to tie this. Uh, 
you see the Texas uh, Governor Abbott's executive order about hate speech. Uh, he has a uh, executive order that just came out. Uh, yeah, that uh, there's a rise in anti-Semitic acts at university. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, shit. Where'd you go? Michael, Michael. Are you there? Check, check, check. I'm back. Where were you? Where were we when, <laughs> the, NSA, when the NSA interrupted? Yeah, uh, I was about to go on a hate speech, but a uh, big divide on the right uh, is governors, the governors that oh, we right. used to praise during COVID, for example, uh, Christy Nome, Ron DeSantis, and now Abbott are issuing uh, anti-hate speech laws, expanding uh, how the state government can go after uh, universities and different organizations for opposing Israel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, this is, okay. Damn, I can't. Mm. I'm not allowed to speak about this, um, but there is someone I'm very close to who is currently uh, researching and writing a, a long piece on, um, on this very thing about the right wing or elements of the right wing who were anti cancel cult cancel culture and pro free speech a minute ago now calling for hate speech laws to protect not Jews to protect Zionists to protect pro Israel people um and Abbott's the latest example these governors are the latest examples of this these absolute hypocrites right who as you said they they rose to fame largely as being opposed to cancel culture and opposed being opposed to the to the limitations on speech under covid i mean that's how christy Nome made her bones and abbott did too i think in large at least in large part certainly and now they're calling for not just hate i mean it's even worse than hate speech laws because it's it's not it's not um hate that they want to make illegal it is a, a political critique they want to make illegal from the river to the sea. Palestine shall be free is a political analysis, critique and statement. It's not hate necessarily at all, but anything like saying free Palestine is part of hate speech. Now, um, boy, does the Israel lobby have some deep tentacles in the American right? We're finding out because do you really think, the good Republican people of Texas would give two shits about some Jewish ethno state in the Middle East if they weren't being told about it by their pastors and their politicians. Because remember, the Christian evangelicals, especially in the South, are the leading Zionists in America now. And they wouldn't even care or know about Israel. Christy Nome, is she North Dakota? Uh, South. South Dakota? Do we think the good people of South Dakota, especially the Republicans, would care at all about the state of Israel? What? Who? Why? If she weren't basically forcing them to care? For that matter, I am, I am almost convinced that Donald Trump would have very different Israel policies were it not for Jared Kushner telling him what to think. It sure seems that way. It seems like Jared really did run Israel policy for Trump. So, um, but yeah, calling, I mean, Trump hasn't called for hate speech laws, I don't think, against anti-Zionists, which is all this is. It's, this is. This is the Israel lobby. This is the state of Israel, everybody. The state of Israel itself 
attempting to make arguments uh, arguments against it illegal in America. I mean, John Mearsheimer, Stephen Walt, everyone go read the book, The Israel Lobby, made a lot of waves. I mean, I think they might have made some analytical errors and getting into causation. I mean, I think some things have not been caused necessarily, like the Iraq war by the Israel lobby. I mean, they certainly contributed to it, but that had deeper and different causes. But but on something like this, and certainly recently, you know, like what the Elise Stefanik circus with the idiot university presidents, that was all APAC orchestrated, clearly. Um, I'm sure she got the idea from the Israel lobby to do that, to, to call those presidents before. I'm sure she got those questions from them. And now you have governors in states where there aren't any Jews who would even care or anybody who would care mm -hmm. about this for any reason. Um, making well, it Ill illegal to be opposed yeah. to an ethno state. I understand Florida, but yeah, Texas and South Dakota. South Dakota, oh, right. especially where there's 500 Jews, if that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Jews are everywhere. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, but in, not in great numbers in South Dakota last night. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, there is, wait, actually, what's the Sioux Falls? Sioux Falls is, is that Sioux Falls? Wait, what's the, no, no, Cedar, what? There's a huge Hasidic community in South Dakota, I think, actually, called wow. Cedar, Cedar Rapids, something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, someone will figure that out. But um, anyway, no, there's not a major Jewish presence there, even even despite that, so. No, it's grotesque hypocrisy on the right. Ben Shapiro, hello, made his name being for free speech because the left doesn't like free speech. The left wants to shut you down if, if you have the wrong political ideas. And I stand for free speech unless you criticize Israel, in which case you just go to prison. Um, who else? Dave Rubin. Yeah. You know, when I was on his show back in the day, which was like, I don't know, five, six years ago, he was, that's what his whole thing was. How the left won't allow you to say what you want to say about politics. And they'll punish you and cancel you and shut you down and maybe even throw you in jail. Oh yeah, he's all about it. He wanted, he, he celebrated when France made it illegal, because France did this, they made it illegal to say free Palestine. He said it was a good thing for France to completely shut down pro-Palestine speech. Uh, I mean, now, and to say, oh, it's because they're Jewish, Ruben and Shapiro, does not explain it at all, because how many Jews have we seen, certainly in the last six months, come out as anti-Zionist? I mean, that's the movement among Jews, is to, is to begin to hate Israel now. So it's not, and the biggest pro-Israel people are people like Douglas Murray, the Gentile. Um, and then all these Christian evangelicals who are kind of running the pro-Israel scene in the United States, they're all Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't explain. I know being Jewish explains nothing about your opinion about Israel. I promise you. It's only if you're around Zionists. I never was around Zionists at all. And none of my Jewish friends were around Zionists either. Like it just, so it wasn't a thing. And so I came to the Israel idea completely neutral. I just didn't think one thing or the other about it. And I think most Jews are part Jews like me, you know, who, who uh, come at, come at that way, conclude very quickly. Oh no, this isn't apartheid ethno state. What, why are we, why is this, why do we think this is a good thing? Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's no, no, there's no, there's no excuse for it whatsoever. Um, and they just need to be, I mean, it's discrediting basically to me. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're, if your whole career is based on being a champion of free speech and then you're calling for, <laughs> and again, it's not making racism illegal, which that's, I mean, that's bad enough, but it is, would still at least be racism, something that basically everyone agrees is not so cool, but like a political ideology, you know, but, yeah. anti Zionism. Yeah, it's conflating a political nation as with the identity, uh, right. as we saw with the what House resolution uh, calling all forms of anti-Zionism anti-Semitism and affirming right. that Israel has a right to exist. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. Um, when the Ku Klux Klan tried to establish a white nation, were they representing me and you? Right? That's what it was. It's like these these people went over there and said, oh, we represent this whole race all around the world. We represent them. We're going to make this nation state and it's going to represent all those people. We haven't talked to them. They haven't taken a vote. They haven't even, we don't even know what they think about this, but we do. We, we represent all the Jews of the, in the world. Like I can, with one Jewish grandparent, I can go get Israeli citizenship tomorrow and go like start like taking houses in the West Bank from Palestinians. Like that's not a joke. That's exactly what goes on. Um, just, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's move on. Yeah. Well, we got, I, I, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, the, the stakes of this are getting higher and higher because Israel bombed the, uh, yes. the Iranian embassy in Damascus and Syria, uh, huge violation of what the Vienna, uh, accords, right? The Vienna convention mm -hmm. of 1961. Yeah. Which just sort of established the basic diplomatic rules globally. So all the signatories, all the nation states that signed the Vienna convention just agree to conduct themselves in various ways when addressing each other, even in times of war. And one of, the, of course, the top principles in it is you can't attack an embassy or a consulate. Like, hello, those are considered to be the sovereign territory of the, of the nation, of the home nation. So the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, according to the Vienna convention, and according to like everyone's thinking about this was not Syrian territory. That was Iran inside that that is iranian territory what they had they bombed it um do we know that they bombed it with american planes they probably they must have f-16s mm -hmm. f-35s one or the other uh, uh so yes this has never happened it didn't happen in world war one it didn't happen in world war ii the only time it's happened that i know of in the modern era is when Bill Clinton bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during the, the Yugoslav wars for the Balkan wars. Um, and then later, but he apologized for it. And, you know, there's a debate as to whether it was accidental or not, but he apologized for it because even Bill Clinton in that imperialist rampage had to acknowledge that you can't do that that you cannot bomb. so and this is i mean just imagine imagine if iran bombed a united states consulate and killed seven american generals in it maybe it's not seven generals but it's several major generals in the iranian military were killed in this can you imagine that like lloyd austin and mark milley were killed when visiting the U.S. consulate in Damascus. I mean, and Iran is bombed them. I mean, there'd be war tomorrow. There'd be war tonight. Um, on so at the same, this is in the same day. I think maybe it was two days apart when Israel killed all those humanitarian aid workers. Mm -hmm. Very clearly, and for people who don't know, this is what's kind of shocking and really. At first, I thought, yeah, it's probably an accident, you know. Um, but for people who don't know, and this is widely reported, it's not controversial. They were, and it was, this was an F-16, I believe. This was a, or it was an American plane, I know that. They see these trucks, there's this truck, seven of them, some of these workers, and they're Brits, they're Americans, Australians, one Palestinian. They bomb the truck, clearly marked. They had told the IDF beforehand. They had very clear communications because Jose Andres is very establishment, globalist guy. And he's cool with the Israeli, was cool with the Israeli government. So they had very, that's the thing about this. He's a Davos guy. The people they just bombed and is a Davos dude. He gives presentations. He's a total Davos globalist. Jose Andres, this chef, his kitchen, they, they were just working in Ukraine on the Ukrainian side. He's a complete like propagandist for the globalist regime, you know? So this is how wild, I mean, the more I'm thinking about this, wow, these two, and the Israeli regime is now. Um, they bombed that guy. So they hit they hit the one truck, 
seven of these aid workers with the world, what's it called? Something kitchen? Kitchen. Cent world Kitchen Central. I always get the name wrong. But anyway, yeah. um, I guess they don't get, not all of them are killed. And the ones who survive that hit, they get out of that truck, get into another one, same marked in the same way. Again, Jose Andres had talked to the IDF and told them, we are going to have trucks going through this time at this time right here. They hit that truck, the second truck. The people who survive that missile blast stagger into a third truck. And this is going on over like, I think it's about a mile long stretch. Just they're driving. They drive like another hundred, couple hundred yards. The third truck gets hit by another missile from an American plane. And everybody's killed. So... The chef, I think it's Jose Andres, right? Isn't that his name? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he just today straight up said they did it deliberately. The IDF, did, is, I think he said Israel, did this deliberately. And what they are doing in Gaza, what did he say? It's a war against humanity. Um, I repeat, this guy until, I mean, even still now is a globalist shill. Like he's, <laughs> I mean, he does really good work, of course, and giving out food to people, but he's doing it on the side of and to gen generally to further the globalist agenda, the NATO, EU, US agenda. So for Israel to be attacking a consulate on essentially the same day, it is telling the entire globalist elite to go fuck themselves. We will kill you if you try to feed these people. Um, I do think people who live in Israel need to start thinking seriously about whether they want to continue to live there, whether it's going to be safe for very long. I don't think it is. I mean, I think at this point, it's almost objectively the, the case that life in Israel is much, much more precarious now than it was before October 7th because of the way they've conducted this war. I mean, they have no friends and they have a world of enemies. And even, even within the establishments in the countries that hold them up and, and support them, even people with hate them. Even members of the United States, Washington, D.C. establishment hate them now. I watch, I've been watching Pod Save America, Pod Save the World, Pod Save the World, which is Pod Save America people. It's the Obama guys. It's the Obama speechwriters. This is this big, it's the biggest liberal podcast. These guys are furious. Like Ben Rhodes ran Obama's foreign policy. These are establishment liberal Democrats. These are the establishment. They, I wouldn't say they hate Israel. They're close. I mean, they are beside themselves about this. Um, and I, so if I am agreeing with the Obama administration on something in foreign policy, that means Israel, you are alone. And just I just don't see. And then we know the polls. I mean, Jews in America are turning against Israel more. And by the way, and now, now that we've now that we're over 30,000 dead and 13,000 kids dead, and every single day there's more and more people who are turning against Israel. And then I see all my friends who are the friends of Israel saying less and less about it and wanting to talk more about how stupid those student protesters were at Vanderbilt University. Look at them demanding snacks at midnight. How stupid they are. I mean, as if that says something about Palestine being an illegitimate cause. Um, so, um, scary. I don't know. We keep saying scary, but yes. I mean, I mean, scary for Israel. I mean, I'm actually scared for Israel, for the state of Israel, for the people who live in it, especially. I, I don't, I think America, I think within five to 10 years, I see American support drying up. I don't know. I don't know if they, I don't know if 10 years from now, they will still get the same support from the U S as they, as they have now. I just don't think, and I mean, like, it's not just the funding. It's not just the $4 billion a year. It's all, it's in many ways, probably more important, just all the intelligence and military coordination and cooperation mm -hmm. that goes on, you know, yeah. and not to, not to mention like fighting wars 
in, in part on their behalf, you know. Um, the United States is uh, presumably playing dumb on both of these instances, saying that they knew nothing about it beforehand. Uh, oh, yeah. Is, is that possibly true? Could that possibly be a sign of a strained relationship between the two countries? And uh, just now, today, uh, Biden had some sort of phone call with Netanyahu after this concerning the attack. And, you know, attacking aid workers sort of undermines the whole liberal response to this by sending more aid and building aid for this. So the forces at play right now against Biden are mm -hmm. so immense. And I'm thinking he has the Democratic base, the Democrat Party base hating his guts and leaving and refusing to vote for him in by the hundreds of thousands and it's growing all the time that number um and i'm fixing my audio um no oh boy sorry everyone what are we talking about uh, we're talking about biden <laughs> oh right yeah we're talking about Biden calling Netanyahu. We're talking the about the forces. Uh, so he's got the entire Democratic base hating his guts, refusing to vote for him. And then he's got the Israel Israel lobby. And yes, there's a lot. And when I say Israel lobby, it's not just APAC. And there's a bunch of formal pro Israel lobby groups in Washington, D.C. Yes, it's Jewish money. Um, Sheldon Adelson, his widow, he was the biggest Jewish philanthropist, political philanthropist, I think. And he, he funds both Republicans and Democrats. And he's a big funder of Biden. And But it just goes on and on. I mean, the, Hollywood is mostly Jewish, big Jewish money. That's always been Democratic Party base of support. I mean, that's essential. That's why Harry Truman agreed to recognize the state of Israel in 1948. Clark Clifford, his chief counsel in the White House, said, hey, man, the election's coming up because the election was like a few months after that in 1948. We need that Jewish money. Sorry for the campaign. Um, and so to just sort of buck the whole Jewish lobby and Jewish establishment in that way, huge force to go against. Then you have, I suppose you could say, you know, the military industrial complex, um, the sort of permanent employees in the Pentagon and then all the defense contractors and all their lobbyists, which is an army, an army of people. And it's a, uh, and it's a mountain of money too. So he has to, but he has, then he needs votes and that's the democratic base. So if he pleases the money side, he's going to lose votes. If he pleases the base, what will the Jewish lobby, what will Jewish philanthropists and what will the military industrial complex do to him and to the Democrats maybe? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I mean, I'm just speculating, but I'm just thinking about what's going on in that poor addled old man's brain right now. Um, he's just, or whoever thinks for him yeah. is weighing those three and there's maybe even more. Well, then there's the state of Israel itself is another force, right? What would they do? And they, everyone needs to think about this. What would the state of Israel do if the United States did, in fact, cut them off? Uh, they were founded, and, and no one denies this, they were founded by terrorist groups. Most famously, the Irgun, which Menachem Begin came out of. He was the leader of the, big, the Irgun. These were acknowledged to be terror. They, they blew up hotels, the King David Hotel in, in Tel Aviv. I mean, they blew up people they blew up they were terrorists it's been a terrorist nation state much of their military campaigns have been you know bomb this building assassinate this guy over here bomb that neighborhood over there it's been a terrorist nation um since the beginning and so would they be capable and by the way have you listened to israeli settlers recently you know the right wing in israel which is now about half the country Ben Gavir, Smotrich, if you listen to these guys talk, do you think they're fanatical enough to do something like that? To launch a terrorist attack against the United States because of this? Because we've backed out of our commitment to them? Oh, definitely. Definitely. These are guys who celebrated Baruch Goldman, who walked into the Tomb of Martyrs, I think it's called. 
um, in Hebron and shot up dozens of Palestinians one day with an, just open fire on them. They were, they were praying in there. Um, and they, you know, these guys, that's, that's their hero members of the Israeli government and the right, the fanatical right wing in Israel is huge and they are seriously, truly fanatical. I mean, they will kill and die for this cause to make that land Israel forever. And so why wouldn't they kill us if we turned our backs on them? And well, on that dark note. <clears throat> well, here's the thing with the consulate bombing, we kind of have no choice but to turn our backs on them because they're pretty much implicitly putting us to war with Iran on this. Like this is a direct attack on a sovereign nation by a sovereign nation with what has to be assumed direct support of the United States unless we very publicly back out and stop supporting this. This is the moment right here. I mean, I, I'm everybody needs to be watching what Biden does on this. This is it. This is the moment. Um, it, to take it beyond this and to continue to, continue to support them as they're slaughtering Palestinian babies and bombing consulates outside of their own borders, <laughs> like this is the worst thing. outside of their own borders and killing aid workers clearly, deliberately three times. Um, I mean. And and the whole world is against this. You know, there's no one. No one is. This is what people don't. I don't understand in some ways. Like he Biden, he got he could have instant um, heroism. Just go to BB, tell him to stop the war. The war stops, and he's the hero. Biden wins votes. The Arabs come. The Arabs in Michigan vote for him again. He'll get all those votes right back instantly if he does that, and more. He'll gain votes from that. Shit, I would look at Biden somewhat more favorably if he did that, if he really made them cease fire in a real way. You know, I'd be like, okay, there's one point out of your miserable career that I agree with. Um, but he doesn't. And it's mm -hmm. just like, it's this zombie foreign policy based on ideas from the 1980s and 90s and the and 1940s and 50s about the sanctity of Israel and the sanctity of the Israel-US relationship, I guess. I don't know. Um, but it's getting to the point where these fucking people in that little weirdo state are driving us to, into a massive global conflict because Iran has to respond to that. They have to, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't have your consulate as a nation state. you can't have your consulate bombed like that and not do something in retaliation that's quite serious. So that's coming. We know that's coming. And once what's going to happen when Iran launches some attack on Israel? What do you think the US military industrial complex and all of its lackeys in the media are going to say? Oh, well, this was a retaliation for this clear violation of international law by Israel. No, they're going to say, look, we've got to go after Iran now. Told you so. <laughs> so the first step of the ladder has been has been stepped on. Israel just stepped up that first ladder of escalation mm -hmm. that's going to go straight to a direct war between the US and Iran. And then, of course, Russia is an ally of Iran. China is becoming an ally of Iran. You know, yeah. all of Europe is, you know, it goes on and on. So there we go, guys. Good good luck. Good job, Israel. They, they got the job done. They're going to make sure we have another world war because they were founded out of the last one. They're, they're sentimental. They're nostalgic. They want another one. Cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we good? You got to go? Yeah, we're good. All right, man. Thank you. Uh, but we are you doing unregistered live still? <clears throat> we're doing unregistered live. Are you going to air this before then? Yeah, it's going to lead up right into it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So in that case, everything's the same for unregistered live. If you want to join us, we hang out on Zoom. We have a meeting with all the patrons of unregistered and unreported. Um, after every unreported every Thursday night. So if you want to join us, all you got to do is become a patron. And it's real cheap and easy. Go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Become a patron at any level and uh, you'll see the link for the show, for the unregistered live. And you'll see me shortly after that on Zoom. Michael, you're a man among men and um, I wish you were the king of the world because you were the hey. smartest of us all. Nah. <laughs> it's true. I'm, all right. <laughs> he can't handle flattery, guys. Um, it's okay. 
It's, it's difficult. All right, man, but you are. All right, go play some drums, you, Negro, you Negro drummer. Peace. Love you, man. <laughs> <laughs>